you're doing today? I'm doing great. How are That's you doing? That's good. Yeah. I'm pretty excellent. And I'd like to welcome everyone listening to Musical Suds, the musical portion of the Geek Bubble. Oh, it's going to be excellent today. We actually, we broke expectations today, Dylan. Yes, we did. We got How did we break that? We got to a second podcast. <laughs> Which I actually didn't think would happen. So. Really? Yes. I, I really like the first one. I think it, I think it went all right. Okay. We, have, we haven't put it up yet. <laughs> but I think, well, I think it went no, good. I, I was going to say, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I'm just kidding. That first podcast was amazing. And you should go check it out. Uh, but today, we got a new album for you. Under the title of Swans. To be kind. We're going to be reviewing the new Swans record, Dylan. Oh, the new Swans record. Have you have you listened to any other Swans? I listened to The Seer a couple times. Okay. Which, okay. no one knows what that is, John. <laughs> well, I don't know, Dylan. But maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, how do we start? This, this is thing? such a great thing. Just for the first two albums, we decided to pick two of the most inaccessible, unknown, like, <laughs> as we possibly can. Well, well done, sir. I, I was feeling bad about that. I, and we're gonna we're gonna be better. We're, we're gonna so be we're better. gonna do next week. We're gonna do something a lot more people can get on board with. And the week after that, I think a lot of people are gonna be able to get on board with what we're talking about. All right. Or at least they, at least they'll listen to some of it. Uh, but for now, yeah, we're talking about swans. And if you don't know what swans are, they're a band that's been around since the 1980s, and they started out as this post-punk experimental band that's was sort of paving the way with music really, really out there. And they were going through the 80s, and they got to the 90s, and about the mid-90s, they made this album called Soundtrack to the Blind, which is considered, like, almost a pioneering album for post-rock. Uh, and then they went on hiatus for about 15 years, until they came back in 2010 with the album My Father Will Guide Me Up a Rope to the Sky. I think it was called it. Yeah. But anyway, the point was that, that you know, Swans came back for reunion, and since then, I believe that Swans has been making some of the most interesting music in the industry uh, for the past five years. At least, in my opinion, it has. But what I think is indisputable is how different and challenging the music of the Swans are. Because I was trying to, I was trying to make it relatable for people to talk about this and say like well they kind of belong in this genre or they kind of belong in this genre but honestly when i was thinking about it it's like i don't think you can put swans in a genre i don't think you can put them in one area and say oh yeah well they're this rock band or like they're this post rock you know there's so much about them that makes them indescribable and then i started thinking well what band can i compare them to what are they like and i couldn't think of that either i don't think there's any band out there right now that sounds like Swans, and it's it's see it's as though that when these guys make music, like they don't listen to anyone else, so you can't hear their influences. They're they're completely doing their own thing, and while that's very unique and refreshing, they're also making music that is harsh, that is epic. And that is extremely colossal. And I mean colossal in every single way. Not only in its sound, but in its length. And because, we're, I'm just, we're just going to get straight to the point here. This album is two hours long, to be kind. Two hours long. And, it's and not, two minutes. It, it's, yeah, it's not only two hours long. It's only 11 songs. And if you want to do yeah. the math on that. A lot, I thought it was 10. And then we got 11 songs in here. No, we? No, it's 10. Well, five on the first, five on the second. Well. Which, You're wrong! You, you say tomatoes. <laughs> yes, there's only discrepancy on one track. Too. But uh, I think, but the point being that if you if you if, if you do the math and divide it up, you're going to figure out that every song on here has to be relatively long. And you'd be correct. Every song on here is extremely long, ranging from about 7 minutes to 32 minutes. 34. Yeah, 34 Crazy, minutes. crazy long. And... I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious, but not everyone is going to want to listen to a 32-minute long track, especially a track that admittedly is very repetitive, that is doing the same thing over and over and over again with very little change. 
uh, <laughs> like a, a lot of people right now think like, why would anyone want to listen to this? I think, well, honestly, I got, let's go to this. Dylan, what did you think of this album? What did I think of Swans, John? Well, I'll start off with just just by saying, I listened to The Seer. So mm-hmm. their album that you loved from two years ago. I've listened to it twice. Okay. I barely remember it. Okay. There's a couple of songs I really like off of it, but for the most part, barely remember it. This album, I've gone, I'm going to say about 10 listens in, which is a lot. It's like 20 hours of my week. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like a lot of stuff on this, actually. But this Unlike the Silver Mount Zion Memorial Orchestra, is not something I don't think I will be going back to. Okay. For the most part. There's a few songs on here that I really like, and I would go back to. On occasion, listening to the album from begin- like beginning to end again, mm-hmm. it's a... It's, <laughs> it's like a war of attrition. <laughs> you, oh, you, uh, yeah, you're... <laughs> I'll talk about the you know I'll, I'll talk about the seer a little bit because you're you're talking about that and was, let's just talk about what Swans have done new with this album because uh, the first album since you know their long departure was 2010. My father will guide me up with this guy was really unique and strange and was kind of the cornerstone for what we're hearing today with them. It was experimenting with folk and rock and noise rock and industrial and post rock it was everything and it was extremely strange and i thought that was a good record I, and i think it wasn't until the seer like you said the seer was my favorite record of 2012 i thought it was just a masterpiece and then the seer was i think it's this this giant piece of emotion in a very diverse way i think the seer at times is very apocalyptic very scary but at other times it's hopeful or energetic and, you know, con- almost a sound of conquest with it. And what's in the Seer, what defined the Seer, I think, was that it was using extremely heavy sounds. I mean, this is some of the heaviest music I've ever heard. But at the same time, it would do folk songs. And there's always this tinge of folk with the Seer, and that made it very diverse, gave it some complexity, and made it a lot more easier to stomach, because you're always getting something new. It wasn't doing the same trick over and over again, it was always refreshing, giving you a new idea, and it was doing it well. And with To Be Kind, I think they've actually stripped away that folk element, and they've gone to just pure to the walls sound, and I think a little more focus on grooves, on the rhythms and oh, the yeah. riffs of this album. Because The Seer had a lot of moments where it was just ambience. It was these big soundscapes that were just... You know, filling, just filling every part of <laughs> your eardrums and just kind of just crunching you into this bit until it finally opened up into some sort of beautiful rhythm section or some sort of apocalyptic, just heavy rip. And that really worked well with it. This album, it doesn't spend that much time with ambience. And there are sections here that are kind of ambient, but they still have a groove and still have a rhythm to them. I think this is Swan's trying to make what is possibly like their heaviest record to date. I'm going to say that between To Be Kind and The Seer, I think that To Be Kind is more memorable. Because I don't, like, there's a track, it's a 32 minute track, again, off of The Seer, that you love. And I think it's just pure noise for most of it. (laughs) And it's annoying. (laughs) Well, like, there, you know, the 34 minute track on to be kind kind of does the same thing but it's more it's less noise and more just we're kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again for a while and i hear less of that ambience and i i like that i actually do well that's one of the things i was kind of going into this album with high expectations with because i was like okay i love that 30 minute track on the seer i think that track is amazing and I was like, oh, they got another one, another extremely long track. Let's see how let's see how this thing goes. And what I'll say about that is that I think that the Seer, which is the which is actually the name, it's the title track of the of the album. Uh, that song it feels like one song. 
like it feels like one piece of music. I will say that. It, yeah. This this one, it's not. And they're quite aware of this because the name of the track is actually um, "Bring the Sun Forward Slash to Send La Overture." So it, it they know that they're making two different tracks that are very separated. However, what I will say is I don't think that makes it any less excellent. I think what they've really just done is they just naturally transition these two songs together, and the songs are also kind of tonally the same, and it, it, it does work very well. Um, when put on the same level, I still think that the Seer is a little bit more of an accomplishment just because it feels like this giant, just giant piece of epic music, musicianship. It feels like a story. And I, actually, I'm just going to take the time to talk about something I just discovered that I think is really funny. Like the Seer, I always thought the song of the Seer was about the end of the world of nuclear war. And, like, I had this theory about it because, like, it's, like, this building music. And then you hear this guy going, like, I see it all. I see it all. And Michael Jira, the singer. And he's just, like, he kept he keeps saying that over and over again. And I was, like, oh, he's seeing, like, all of this, like, hatred and turbulence build up between these nations where they just blow each other away. And then I was watching an interview with Michael Jira. And he was, like, they're, like, what is this here? Why did you say that? And he was just, like, oh, I just, it sounded good with the music. So I just <laughs> threw it in there. So it's, like... Uh, so that's what, uh, that's the one thing I'm going to talk about is with the lyrics of this album is that very face value like okay. I don't know if he means anything here but like every time I listen to it I'm always thinking like there seems to be something deep here there seems to be something very intelligent going on but when I hear him doing that kind of stuff like oh yeah that just sounded cool I'm just like no god well, <laughs> I think that he like Michael Jira uses his voice as an instrument Mm -hmm. a lot especially like in tracks in bring the sun actually like there's just a point where he's basically just like like doing a vibration thing with his mouth and it's like oh all right yeah i, I, I agree on that i think honestly he's almost like a living sample like he's he's just trying to add more texture to the album at times but honestly there are other times where i think that i think that he honestly plays uh, that sort of conventional lyrical role. Like, he's delivering lyrics in the way that an artist should. Like, you have the separation between the music and the artist, and he seems to do that well at points. And then there are other points where, yeah, I agree, he completely just seems like an instrument. Like, he is totally just textual there. I think in the beginning of Bring the Sun is, uh, I think in the song, uh, what is the name of that? In Oxygen. Like, Oxygen, like, that track is so raw. And then, <laughs> like, the crazy way he delivers those lyrics just, like, makes this... I think sends that song to a whole other level of just being insane to me. That is. But, however, on songs like Christian Supine, To Be Kind, uh, especially A Little God in My Hands, I think he is delivering lyrics, lyrics that sh should be thought about, even if they have no meaning. Um, and I, I think that's also pretty impressive. Uh, there's also, uh, we'll just add in there, there's a, there's a lot of other guest vocalists on here, uh, one of them being saint vincent for anyone who's into indie pop she's a pretty good artist and she lends her vocals on a few tracks here um especially i think the track some things we do which is a very very strange track it's the quietest track by far oh, yeah. it's the, pretty much the only track in here that's actually quiet and it's basically <laughs> you got them both going over saying all these things we do like we're talking about like how like you know we sing we reach we <laughs> we taste and just saying like when I hear it it sounds like he's saying all the things that human beings can do and it sounds like like wonder like like just this curiosity like why do we bother doing these things or almost or even disappointment of like why why are we restrained to just doing these things we're just living our lives in a way that are just designed for us like when we put some of these own constraints on us um, but once again that's just me just <laughs> Possibly reading too much in reaching because this is Michael Jira. Something I don't know. I mean, but he, we see a lot of that in this album. We see a lot of him just taking these simple phrases and just adding new words to them. We see that in screenshot where he says like, you know, no pain, no death, no suffering. You know, um, a little god in my hands. He gets forever, forever beautiful, forever lazy. You know, like he keeps doing this throughout each track, which I think 
helps promote your argument for him being more of an instrument. Like, he's going to add all those things, and whatever order these have, these lyrics have, they seem to be completely inconsequential. You could put them at whatever order you want. And if there's a point, maybe. Um, but that doesn't really matter because he adds so much here because he has, I think he has a ton of energy on here. Oh, he does. I was actually talking to you about this before where I really do like his voice. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different thing from the Silver Mons I Have Memorial Orchestra because... <laughs> That voice was annoying, and we're just going to forget about it. But this, his, Michael Jira's voice is awesome. And it works really well, especially in tracks like She Loves Us and uh, Kirsten Supine or whatever it is. Those two tracks, I love hearing like what he says. It, it, I mean, I always think that Michael Jira, he has this uh, tenacity and this evilness to his, the way he delivers vocals. And that's a really good way to describe his music. It's evil. His music is very conniving. And it's got, it always seems to have this sinister, like, message to it. Or, like, at least tone to it. Like, with Screenshot. Like, there's a moment in Screenshot about halfway through where it introduces this, um, I'm just going to say it's like an electronic tone. And it's just crunchy. And it's dark. And it, it just adds so much to the track. But... I mean, as far as Michael Jira is singing, I think on songs like Christian Supine, because we're getting a lot of his just maniacal, insane delivery. Oh, yeah. I think when we hear songs like Christian Supine and the finisher here, uh, To Be Kind, we actually get that emotional presence from him. Like, I feel like he has a very good emotional depth of like how to, how to trick the listener into feeling some sort of empathy. Or what he's saying, like he did, he did that very well on the Seer. On the Seer, there's a lot of tracks where he kept it more simple and more, you know, from a folk standpoint, wasn't just losing his, he wasn't going batshit crazy on the track. And like those are moments I really enjoy him. I like a vocalist who can be diverse in his delivery. And this guy, when he's trying, when he needs to get the crowd going, when he needs to rile you up, he knows how. But when it's more down to earth, he also <laughs> really knows how to do that. And this, and honestly. This is a guy who's 60 years old. These guys have been since the, here since the 60s. Not since the 60s. These guys have been here since the 80s. Yeah. And he, he's getting pretty old, but listening to this, you wouldn't know that. Because he has 10 times more energy than most vocalists do in working in the industry today. They're in their 20s. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty stunning to see this guy hold. Um, the thing that I was trying to compare him to uh, was he really sounds like a, a singer that would fit right in at home in a band from the 70s mm -hmm. like he would just if you put his voice in there it would work and you know i point out she loves us and kirsten Supine. both of those i was pointing both of them out because in like she loves us he's very you know like in your face basically yeah. and then kirsten is like that emotional side and i'm saying that i love the fact that he can contrast like that mm -hmm. and it works really well and I love those two tracks. <laughs> Especially from like the musical standpoint of both oh, of those yeah. tracks. Like this music is so like I like to say primal. Like it's reaching down to human beings' emotional states in the simplest of ways. And I think that's one of the reasons that people, at least who give it a shot and can stand music that's this long and that's repetitive, uh, enjoy it so much because what tones and sounds he is creating, they're brilliant for how simple and yet how resonant they are and like especially like <laughs> when you look at a track like like natalie neal which we haven't really we've really taken the time to talk about but natalie neal is that second half of natalie neal it's just it is one of the most like triumphant sounds <laughs> i've heard in well a few years it, it is it's seriously it is one it is a track that has so much purpose to it and it's, it feels inspiring, and yet, like we said before, there is, a, there is a cynical and there is an evil tinge to every single song in here. Like, there's nothing that's really hopeful or just joyous, like there was in Seer, at least. There are sounds here that are a little more happy, if you want to call them that, but there's always some undertone of, like, you know, this is nasty. This is seem like twirling the mustache sort of <laughs> things. It's like, he's got bad intentions. 
you know, you do say, you know, it, it kind of, it gets repetitive. And in some tracks, I say that it definitely does. Like the second half of Bring the Sun. Okay. It does get really repetitive. But the first half of Bring the Sun, like just contrasting how big this song is that I can do this. The first half, there is build-up. And the build-up is epic. And it's really, really well done. And I love it. Other songs like um, A Little God in My Hands does it too. And then it ends up coming to like a big, like, ruckus <laughs> sound at the end that's <laughs> that, just like, that, like, pressuring your ears. That moment in A Little God in My Hands, I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't want to spoil it for people here who haven't heard the song. But there's a moment in A Little God in My Hands where it just hits you <laughs> with one of the most, like, deafening walls of sound ever. Like, you got, I feel like there's, like, thousands of horns that are just, like, <laughs> We're going to become a beehive of horns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're just going to throw everything we have at you right now and <laughs> see if you can take it. It's like, I feel like since that's one of the shorter, tra- sh- shorter tracks, if like, check that track out. If you like it, definitely check this album out because that's going to be a test for you. Because if you, if you hear that wall of sound and you're like, no, this is stupid. This is horrible. This hurts my ears. Okay, move on. But if you're like, that was insane. That was pretty cool. Definitely, definitely check the music out because that's what this has to offer. And, and you're talking about how they're long and they're repetitive, but they build. And like, I I agree with you. And like for the Seer, I considered that album a post rock album when I was trying to define the best I could. Which really is me just like there are elements of post rock here, but there's so much more. And I think that's one thing the Swans with this, at least with their latest albums, for Reunion, have been honing. They've been honing post-rock sounds in an interesting way, because if you ask me, post-rock has been pretty uninteresting in recent years. And they're doing something very unique, and something that's challenging post-rock, kind of straying away from post-rock at times, and still feels very post-rock. And I think the song Bring the Sun is absolutely post-rock track. Oh, yeah. Let's put it like... It's 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 a track that starts out <laughs> probably the most explosive like track on here how it starts with just about a good few minutes of just every instrument is just pounding on this one note it just goes over and over and over and over and over again and then it stops and, and then it builds it, right up again it, exactly and it's and like I thought that would be the end of it when I first oh, heard yeah. it I was like okay that's the end they're gonna go on something new no they actually just slowly just pick up that same tone and that build was is expertly done the oh, yeah. tension that they create there is incredible and it's about a 10 minute build but it holds your attention so well and it keeps building to the point and then what i love about this band is they they build to about the max that you feel that it can go like a lot of post rock bands they tend to like okay here's our here's our climax and we're not going to go as high as we can go but this can be pretty climactic swans hits you with everything they possibly have. And Bring the Sun is incredible because it goes so hard at the end that it feels like, how could they get any any harder? And really, they can't. And what happens to the track is it feels as though like it just, it it implodes on itself because so much is going on that it just, it just lets everything just dissipate because that's the only way it could possibly end. And it's just, it's such a satisfying track. I, I, I love Bring the Sun. I think that was and then we'll talk about this two cents, two cents, Lou uh that you, I feel, you feel so terribly about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's like that second, the first half is amazing. And I remember like sitting in my car, I'm just about ready to go to work, and it's like, I'm gonna, I'm finishing this. This is really cool. <laughs> but it's like, then, you know, I go and I listen to that track again, all 34 minutes of it, and basically it hits that, that peak at probably about 15 minutes, 13 to 15 minutes, somewhere it's, it's in there. It's around the 15-minute mark. Now, after that, now you have 20 minutes of essentially, you know, it's it's all right, like, I'm, it's starting to grow on me a little bit in the last couple listens, but I remember for the first, like, seven listens, I was like this... <laughs> This second <laughs> half is so long. It takes forever to get through. And to put it in perspective, 
I love the song, She Loves Us. I keep bringing it back up because I really like it. Mm -hmm. That song is 17 minutes long, and it feels like a 10-minute track. Mm -hmm. it, it, in fact, it probably feels like more like a 7-minute track. It's not that long. I mean, I... What I'll say about Two Cent, Lear Overture, is that there, there's... Like I said before, there's very little... There's a lot less campiness in this album than there was this year. Or even, my God, my father will drive me up the road to the sun. I hate that album title. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let, but, let's clarify. But, it is, my father will guide me up a rope to the sky. Okay. There you go. We're never saying it again. We're yeah. just going to call it my father. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I was saying about like the, the ambience. There's a lot of ambience in Seer, and there's a lot less here. And I think the only times we really get any strong ambient tracks is in the second track, Just a Little Boy. Yeah. And in Tucson Literature, which even though these tracks are technically ambient, they still act those tracks still have climaxes like oh, yeah. right at the end. But it's still there. And <laughs> To me, that's the that that is the only time this tracking this album gets any sort of strong diversity, uh, at least for the first half. Of it. Like that's where we get a little bit of time, just sort of get enveloped in the sound, and and we know that that's what they're trying to do because that's where the samples come out. And just little boy, he we get this laughing sample of like all these people just having this maniacal laughing, and. It's demented. It's just yeah. It's so demented. It's disturbing. But like just in the same way that Tucson Le Overture is disturbing, and with this, it's got the sample of this horse. And oh, yeah. horses aren't disturbing, but the way they contort the sound of this horse that's just galloping and neighing, it sounds so strange. You're like, what is this horse galloping through a river of blood, like <laughs> gore? And the horse sounds like it's demonic and. They they know how to get you into a mood of dread and a mood of paranoia. And that's another thing I'm going to honestly compliment this music on, is that it's so atmospheric, even when it's just blasting instruments at you. Like, it feels <laughs> so oppressive in that sense, but at the same time, it's so absorbing. At least for me. But at the same time, I can feel people who are like, not hypnotized by it in the way that I am, and just like this is boring, this is terrible. Like that, I'm I'm trying to reiterate the ideas of this music is not for everyone. In many ways, it's very pretentious music. It's very specific, very pretentious yeah, music. It's, it's very specific audience that is trying to reach. But those who do enjoy it, this is this is the cream of the crop for those who do enjoy it. Like I said started to like the second half of Bring the Sun, because I, I don't feel like pronouncing what it is. Okay. I started liking it a little bit more in the last couple of listens. And that's because it really does have that the sense of dread that you're talking about. And it it's creepy. It's creepy. When you listen to it, you're like, this is this is really creepy. Like, <laughs> and this that's, is scaring the shit off me. And that's where Michael Stewart is at his like most insane. Oh like, yeah. Like that's this where he's he's trying to pronounce this French name of this like Haitian revolutionary, and it's just the way he does it is so. Like, he's like Tusser. <laughs> it's it's it's. I don't want to ruin it. it. It is truly, it's memorable. You will not forget the way this guy pronounces it. It's it's awesome a lot of people are going to be like i hate this but it's stupid but <laughs> it's really awesome it's it's cool yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty neat so it's, 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 I, I like it a little and, bit and well i i kind of want to talk about the track the last track to be kind uh, do, do you have any thoughts on to be kind? i thought to be kind was underwhelming after everything else in this album like i love the first second third beginning of the fourth track not too big on the last track of the, the first album, or the first CD. Second CD, I love the second CD a lot. Mm -hmm. But To Be Kind, it just, it kind of, it never really grew on me as much as I thought it would. And like, when I first listened to it, I found it completely unmemorable. First few listens, I, I can barely remember it. It's, it's still, it's up there a little bit. Okay. I mean, it's only, it's only eight minutes long, eight and a half minutes long. <laughs> Only, only is just 
a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, I I, I kind of had a similar a similar feeling about it when I first started listening to the album. Like, to be kind was a little underwhelming for me. I was like, that's how you're ending it. But then <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead. I think that is like the full perfect ending for this album now that I've kind of like You just want to love more. Swans John. No no dude this is really <laughs> this is this is how you end an album. The out al- there so to be kind starts out extremely quiet and it's just like just kind of just hands everything over to Michael Jira's vocals. Very soft, very mean Which vocals. Is what became memorable yes. later, but the last half of "To Be Kind" is basically the band just like having like four or five attempts of having just like just blasting the music as loud as they can. It's like they're like, okay, here are all the last like that kind of like like how <laughs> most music like that has that climactic last note that's just an explosion. It's like this is this is the end. Swans does this like five times, and it, they like all right, here's our first one. All right, or if you thought that was good, all right, like, and they do they keep doing this and doing this and doing this. That is how you end this freaking album because this album is so huge and so epic at so many moments. The only way I think they really could have ended it was with something that was just nothing but completely oppressive, and it feels. It feels like a finale. And like the last the last blast they have, like this last blast of music kind of ends this motif, this musical motif they have, because it it, it ranges through the entire album of and we start we first start seeing it in uh Toussaint Le Ouverture, uh where they the music starts layering on and layering on and layering on and it's, it, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier to the point that we're hearing this one guitar that is just plucking at this one note so hard and so viciously that it, it feels it feels as though like the music is gonna tear through your headphones and attack you. And it this it's a it's a musical motif that they're going with here. And it's it's something that that's how they end the album with. And it's so powerful. Like at least once you really digest the album, it's two hours long. <laughs> once you realize what they're doing. I think to be kind of so appropriate. Like, I don't know. I like. I was just sort of listening to it a few days ago, and I was like, I, I really want to talk about that because, god damn, that was. They really got me with that track. I I love. It. I I I can see what you're saying, and honestly, like from that that thought process, like the grand finale, I. It made me think immediately of like fireworks. Like if you yes, go to a fireworks exactly. show. You got all the build up, and then they keep reaching those, you know, s- kind of climactic things. You're like, "Oh, that was impressive! Oh, that was impressive!" And then it's like, "Shit, we got all this leftover firework stuff. We're just gonna launch it all at once." That, that's <laughs> like, exactly what it's like. like yeah. it's not even a track. Right. It's not yeah. even a song. It doesn't even have a rhythm to it. It's just like shooting as much music as it can right. at you in burst. And it, it's exact. I did a firework finale. Yeah, it is. <laughs> this <laughs> album is a firework show. <laughs> I, I like that that sort of description. It's very appropriate. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about this album? Not, not really. Okay. I mean, oh, oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Basically, oxygen is where the band's like, we had all this really dark atmosphere going on and oxygen room is where they're just like <laughs> nope <laughs> i don't know we why don't you talk about oxygen? I, honestly i that track makes me laugh it's like eight minutes long and michael jira's voice just starts screaming out oxygen but the like they as it keeps going they're like now it's distorted now it's even more distorted the, what is he saying? Those those crazy wall of horns from a little guy in my hands comes back in oxygen, except it's just like it sounds like this cat purring, like <laughs> 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 you know. <laughs> it's it's actually it's a really heavy song from start to finish. Like that, that song, like 
It is so heavy. I, I agree with you, it, but it's simplistic though. It, oh, yeah. It's not like the wall of sound that they're doing. It's just it just feels very raw. Um, I will say that there's one thing about Oxygen where it's like it's about in the middle. It feels like like it becomes a Death Grips track where you're just like. I'm just waiting for MC Ride to yeah, burst forward. Right. He's like, yeah, you got the fever. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I I don't really have much else to talk about. I mean, I could talk about every single track here and just all the brilliant things I do, all, all the brilliant things it does, um, especially just, I mean, we, we haven't emphasize too much about the bass lines no which are album. amazing but basically the bass lines are what make this album oh yeah it, it always leads in with this incredible bass line it's pretty simple and just builds and builds and builds on it and god every single one is so good it is so good um yeah and then that's really all i'll say for now um i'm also gonna say that there are some tracks on here that are just straight up badass like screenshot um little <laughs> god in my hand she loves us screenshot is those are awesome and then there's like it's in kirsten supine that i just i can't stop like quoting it because it entertains me so much <laughs> and it's like just his lyrics you kind of i didn't know what he was saying for one of the words and i actually had to look it up and it's like oh he was saying that. Yeah. All right. Well, a lot of stuff you hear him saying, you're just like, he's not. This sounds that. like he's saying that, but that'd be incredibly stupid. And you look it up, you're like, oh, oh no, look that. that's what he's saying. Like, he there's, there's a part where it's like he's going, mow, mow, yeah. mow, mow, and you're like, is he is he trying to say like now, <laughs> like what what? No, it's literally <laughs> mow, as in like M A M A U. Yeah, that, <laughs> like that's he wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I also agree that I think Screenshot is pretty much a perfect song. Awesome opener yeah. to the album. It really does set the tone. Yeah. Um, so, a rating. A rating? Oh, it's... You know, I actually, I want to talk about how are we going to rate these things? How, how are we going to rate our albums? You know, the first one, I, just, I went, you know, four stars. Are we going to do, like, you know, should we do, like, one, two, three, four, and five? Yeah, we'll, do, two, we'll yeah. do five, you know. We might come up with something a little more... Sophisticated. Creative or sophisticated. <laughs> but for now, we'll just do it out of five stars, and you can give it, like, the point fives because, okay. you know. Well, I, I was I was just kind of thinking about that. Or do we want to go, I'm going to give it a, you know, a solid four, or, like, ah, it's barely making the four, or are we going to be, like, nah, 3.5? Sure. Yeah, you can. Okay. I mean, you, well, whatever, I, I, whatever just, just like do it. whatever you feel is right. right, Dylan. <laughs> I want you to be able to sleep at night. <laughs> with the way you're you rating know, these you know, albums. You know what? I, I couldn't. This entire week, I couldn't sleep because I couldn't <laughs> think about this. <laughs> it wasn't It wasn't fixed. All right. uh, I'm going to give it a solid 3.5. A 3.5. It's a 3.5. I actually I did enjoy this, but it is brought down for me by a few tracks on this. Specifically, Bring the Sun. The first half of Bring the Sun is a lot of fun. Like I said, I'm, I'm starting to like the second half, but the fact that it took me nine listens to get there is kind of bad considering it's a 34 minute track and that is a fourth of the album all right so i have to bring it down a little bit i would rather listen to fuck off get free okay so Here, here's what i'll i like the seer more than this album i was actually gonna ask you that i yeah i think the seer is a more accomplished work it's a more diverse work I think the Seer is still their masterpiece. However, I'm I'm gonna give this album a four point five. A four point five. I, I I absolutely love this album. I what I love is I love albums that stick with me and that kind of like haunt my thoughts. And this album has definitely been doing that. It's an album that is extremely intimidating for me as well. And I like that. I like an album that feels like just more than the album. It feels like an experience. In all honesty, I think the only reason I'm giving this a 4.5 and not a 5 and not a 5 is because we only had a week to listen to this thing. Yeah. And I I just haven't been able to give it enough listens to the point where I'm so comfortable with it and I just know so much about it that 
I love it. And I was, I was getting, I'm getting to that point because I was listening to it yesterday and I, I could feel that like I am I'm absolutely in tune with this album. So it's a 4.5 for now, but I could totally see this thing at the end of the year being in my top three albums for sure. It is, it is an experience that I know I'm going to be going back to over and over and over again throughout this year because I don't, it, like I said before, these guys are just making music that I've never heard before. I had never heard anything like this. And it, it's just mind blowing that this guy who is <laughs> in his twilight years, as some would say, is redefining a lot of genre and music in general. I would say, not to be hyperbolic, but God, this is great stuff. And it's, this is, they're on a roll. I mean, honestly, this is their third album that has been incredibly sophisticated, experimental, and yet it's enjoyable. So, yeah. high Highest recommendations I can give still. Yes, if you're pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't want to scare people away. Like, uh, oh, no, it's only for people who, you know, think they're so intelligent. But No, it's... I, <sighs> I found this album to be relatively enjoyable because I thought I was going to hate this a lot. <laughs> like, I thought I was going to... Oh, John Pink Swans. I'm going <sighs> to sit here and listen to this two-hour-long album. And you're right. Only a week to listen to this album is not enough time. And, I mean, we put a lot of listens in. To it. Ten, ten listens. It's a lot of listens, and you know, I I might go back to it towards the end of the year when we do our end of the year list because I hope we actually do that. Yeah. Fun. And you know, I I go back to this. There are a few tracks that I will go back to, and you know, I might just end up going and listening to the whole album again. All right. Maybe. That. I'm proud of you, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried, John. And, and I apologize, because I knew, I knew it was like, I was going to give this to him, like, all right, here you go. Here's this little band named Swans. And I was like, I knew. Don't look at the length. <laughs> and I apologize, but guess what? Next week is the a little roots. treat for you. Uh, the Roots is next week, and so, it's going to be awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone. Once again, Also, we, before we quit. We got something. Hold on. Recommendations. If to get into this album. I like that. I like that we did that last week. If this See, there's nothing like swans. Okay. But this I was just gonna say, like, I I was thinking about that because I was like, he's probably gonna ask me like what is some stuff you should check out if you like swans? And I guess you could check out more stuff by Michael Jiro. <laughs> <laughs> like he's got some other bands that are fairly interesting. Um when I was listening to this album, I kind of got a feeling, the same sort of uh, dynamic feeling that I got with the last Tim Hecker album. And Tim Hecker is an uh, ambient artist, but if you like the sounds and the sort of dynamics that Swans are getting out of here, I definitely think that you'd be interested to see the sort of sounds that Tim Hecker is making. Tim Hecker also makes extremely inaccessible music that only a very small amount of people will like. I wasn't, I wasn't even as big a fan of Tim Hecker's latest album. I think it was good. I think it was great. Um, I was more getting along with the fact that um, if you want to get into Swans, could you just dive right in? Could well, you do that? Or is there something that you could bridge the gap? With? No, no. I, I don't think there's any way to, to slowly build your way up to Swans. If that's I what you're think asking. so either. <laughs> it, like, honestly, a lot of people who I've talked to about this with the swan, with swans, is that the, the only way to really do do swans is you have to take it head on. You have to listen to something like Soundtracks of the Blind or The Seer, and you just have to you have to not you have to be great. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can do just, it. You have to stick with it. Like, I I think a lot of people won't like this starting out when they're listening to it. Oh, yeah. But I think if you if you keep listening to it, because I've shown a lot of friends this, and, like, I listened to it once, it was really repetitive, and I don't want to go back to it. I'm like, no. Keep going back to it. It will reward you. The more you put into this album, it will reward you. It is a challenging album. And, I mean, soundtracks, we think this album's long. Soundtracks for the Blind is two and a half hours long. It's even longer. And that album... It's just all over the place. Yeah, it's got these kind of post-rocky tracks and these really hard tracks, and then they even throw a live track in there. Like, 
Yeah, here's a live recording they have. It's probably off. You know, <laughs> these guys are insane. Their first, the fifth first album, Spill Pop, and Green, and <laughs> Green, they were, they sound like they're just hitting, like, household utensils and just screeching. Like, these guys, forever, have been making some the most challenging music in the industry. And I think it's brilliant, but at the same time, geez, it is so hard to like. You, you're completely right with the fact that you have to give it more listens. I had to force myself to give it more listens, because at first listen, I was like, oh, thank you, John, this is <laughs> fun. But it's kind of like, you know... As it kept going, I'm going to say, like, probably the second or third listen in, I found some tracks that I could really get a hold of, and I really liked. And by, like, the seventh or eighth, I I like most of this album. It's awesome. I mean, it's... it's but it's still, still 3.5. It's still trying it's to... It's 4.5. <laughs> it's still trying to entertain you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's still, it's like, we're, we're still rocking out. We're still enjoying ourselves. It just happens to do a lot of other things, too. Um... So, I think we should end it there, Dylan. Yep. Thanks for coming on, as usual. Mm-hmm. And all all you viewers or listeners that you know, ten of you, we love 15, you. We love you back, all. <laughs> spread the word. Our loyal fans. The Geek Bubble musical suds. Uh, and next week, we're gonna be having a guest. Yes. Someone to join us and discussing a little hip hop album that came out recently, and we hope you guys enjoyed that. So. Stay tuned, and that should tell you right there, though, that we are not just doing pretentious music like this no. for the two hours. We're doing no. everything. Everything. We've been we've been cruel long enough. Yes. <laughs> We're selling out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, let's sign off here. I'm John. I'm Dylan. And this is Musical, Musical Suds! I remember this time. <laughs> yeah.